Hey, Anthem, Bert here. Go ahead and open up to the book of John chapter 15. John chapter 15. If you are new or newish or just finding this video, we are working through the book of John together as a church of house churches. And we're aiming to end right around Easter time. Now, go ahead and turn to the book of John chapter 15. And we're actually going to start right around verse 18. We're going to skip a portion of John chapter 15. Why, you may ask, is because we devoted the whole month of January to John 15, verses 1 through 17. So we took an entire four-week, four-part series to work through Jesus' beautiful picture and analogy of the vine, the vine dresser, the branches, fruit, all of that. And so if you are missing that part, or if you're not with us in January, or you want to simply go back and revisit that, please go check out the podcast or the videos from our John 15 series that we called Christian Mystics, the ancient art of abiding with Christ. But today we're actually going to pick up in the narrative right after that moment in John chapter 15. So in our last video part here, we were in John chapter four, uh, 14, and in John chapter 14, uh, the narrative ends with Jesus say, saying, rise, let us go from here. So just a bit of context setting for those of you who may be less familiar with where we're at in the story of John so far. So what's happening is Jesus has entered uh, the city of Jerusalem, and so the narrative of John slows down quite a bit. So the first bit of John uh, chapters, you know, up until about chapter 12, look at many years of Jesus' life teaching and ministry with his disciples. And then with the triumphal entry in John chapter 12, the narrative here slows down. And instead of talking about weeks, months, or even years, we're looking at one week, an important week, the very last week that Jesus is here physically on earth with his disciples before the cross, before the resurrection. So we have the kind of upper room discourse as it's been known. Jesus is uh, sharing the Passover meal with his disciples and there they're eating. Uh, He's washing their feet and Jesus is giving many, 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 many hints that something big, dramatic, and traumatic is coming. He says, I will not be with you longer. I'm going to the Father. I'm going away soon. And he's even starting to call out that one of them, one of those 12, will betray him. And so we have this teaching from Jesus, and we have him washing feet, and we have him teaching and trying to prepare his disciples for his departure. And he has this momentous movement in John chapter 14 saying, I'm the way, the true, the life. He's talking about the helper. He's not going to leave us as orphans. He's going to send someone or something to help us to fill the gap. And Jesus communicates to us that it's actually better that he goes away. And the narrative says, rise, let us go from here. So just imagine the scene. They're around dinner. It's nighttime. Jesus is preparing them for his exit. And he just drops this bomb on them. Then he says, it's actually better that I go so you will get the Holy Spirit. And he says, let's get up. So they get up from the the dinner table. They start walking in the dark streets of Jerusalem. And it's in that context that he has a few more teachings for them. But it's this teaching on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, where we know the arrest will happen, and then he'll be taken before the religious leaders, then Pilate, then the crucifixion. And all of that is coming in the narrative. But John chapter 15, 16, and the prayer in 17 is this on the way to the garden movement. And so that's where we get Jesus says, I'm the true vine. My father is the fine dresser. Abide in me and I will be new. You can't do anything apart from me. That whole narrative is happening as they're just taking a walk in the dark streets of Jerusalem on the way to the garden of Gethsemane. And that's where our narrative picks up today in verse 18. He just says, abide in me. As I abide in you, apart from me, you can do nothing. He says, love one another. I don't call you servants, but I call you friends. And then he picks up here in verse 18. Now, before I read the narrative, I just want to set all that context for you. Before I read the narrative, I want to share a quote, one of my favorite quotes from C.S. Lewis, uh, the Christian writer, author, philosopher, famous for writing the Chronicles of Narnia series. But he also writes a lot of theology and commentating on his relationship with Jesus and Christianity as a whole. And he once said, quote, I didn't go to religion to make me happy. I always knew a bottle of port would do that. If you want religion to make you feel really comfortable, I certainly don't recommend Christianity. 
Now, I love that quote because the text today certainly reminds us that the Jesus life, the one of following him and and aligning and bending our life to be more like him is certainly not one of comfort or ease. And Jesus, as he's speaking to his disciples here, starting in verse 18, he's speaking to them with the full intent that they will continue to believe not and continue to follow Jesus, but in that belief and in that following and discipleship of Jesus, they will experience resistance, pushback, hardship, and even persecution and hatred from the world. So prepare to be uncomfortable as we work through this section here. But starting in verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember that the word, remember the word I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they keep if they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him. Who sent me? They do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have not been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. I'll go a couple more verses here. If I had not, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, They would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Now go ahead and pause right there. Here in the narrative, we get kind of a grim picture from Jesus, right? He's he's basically saying union with Christ, which is this idea we talked about back in January in John chapter 15, union with Christ goes both ways. We get the love of the father and Christ is in us and we are in Christ But that's not all we get with union with Christ. We also inherit the hatred of the world that they have for Jesus now is imparted on to us. Jesus has been just teaching the disciples that they're invited to abide in him and he will abide in them. And that powerful reality has so many implications that we've already unpacked together as a church. But one of the implications is that what Jesus gets into here is that when we're united with him, we get all the benefits, but we also get something else. All the hatred that the world has towards God, Jesus, may be applied to his church. Now, put yourself here in in these shoes. The the hatred that particularly the religious leaders had of Jesus was, was quite palpable, right? They did not like that he was breaking their rules and messing everything up. But, but we can even picture kind of the situation now that, that many, of, many people in the world do not love the church, Christians, Jesus. His, like, and, and that's not without reason, right? If we're being really honest, the church over the years has done a lot of things to warrant that kind of resistance. But what Jesus is saying here is that we should not be surprised by it, like, Peter reminds us, but we should anticipate that the world will hate us. Now, why the world hates us is something we have to get into here. Because what Jesus is teaching is that the world will hate us, but not for any reason. There's a key line in here where Jesus says, all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Often Christians and the church get into quite a trouble, quite a bit of trouble, not because of Jesus' name, but because of silly decisions that we're making here that have nothing to do with Jesus. Right? Jesus is teaching us that when we live the abiding life, one that the, uh, the fruit of that life is his righteousness, and in the same way the world kicked against Jesus' righteous presence, they will kick against whatever righteousness that we bring to the table. But often we get in trouble because The world hates us for other reasons. One thing to note here is Jesus is not frustrated for the world, for its persecution of him. He actually expects it, anticipates it. It's a part of the equation. And true persecution is a sign that you're in the right place doing the right thing. 
Now, I say true persecution because uh, one Christian author famously said it's not persecution if somebody doesn't like you because you're a jerk, right? That's why I wanted to call your attention back to verse 21. Like hardship, resistance, persecution on account of Jesus' name is a real deal. But the hardship, persecution, or resistance we face because we're jerks or we face some kind of inconvenience here, that's, that's not really what Jesus is getting at. Are you tracking with me? There are a lot of things we do as Christians that draw the ire of the world. Some of them are legitimate persecution. And I'm talking we as in the global church. But much of it is simply Christians acting entitled or frustrated that the world sins and and that that the world doesn't look like us because of it. It's famously trying to legislate Christian morality, right? It's just, that's not really what Jesus is getting at here. He said, when you live in line with my life, producing the fruit of the Spirit and bringing to bear the kind of righteousness that Jesus imparts to us, it will inherently go against the way of the world because the way of the world is not the kingdom of God. But there's a distinction here we have to make of, are we being facing resistance, hardship, because of decisions we're making, because we're entitled, because we're frustrated, or we are facing resistance and hardship because we are truly living the way of Jesus, and that will run counter to the way of the world. Jesus is inviting us to anticipate something like what he experienced, Right? Imagine perfectly living out the fruit of the Spirit and the world still hating you. You're loving, joyful, peaceful, patient, kind, good, self-controlled, gentle, and the world still persecutes you. That's what Jesus is telling his followers to expect. When you are truly becoming a person of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, gentleness, all of those, the world will not understand and will push back and will resist. This is what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is teaching us that persecution, resistance, pushback is the expected outcome of faithful living. Now, it's going to look differently in any time and any place. Resistance might look different in Iran or China today than it does in America or the westernized world today. It may look different 50 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Like, no matter your time and place, resistance to the will and way of God will look different, but it is there. And Jesus says it's not a bug, it's actually a feature. It's a built-in known quantity in following Jesus is that you are going against the current of culture. You're going against the current of the world around us. But Remember Jesus' words from John chapter 14. I will not orphan you. I won't leave you. I'll send you a helper. And so Jesus reminds his disciples of that as he's telling them to expect persecution, resistance, hardship, and hatred of the world. He says, I'm not leaving you alone. And he reminds them that he will send the Holy Spirit. Verse 26, chapter 15. And when the helper, which is Jesus' kind of euphemism for the Holy Spirit, when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you will also bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I've said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. And indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering a service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when the hour comes, you may remember what I told you. He said this over and over and over in John, particularly in his last week. I'm saying all these things to you so that when they actually happen, you will believe. You will know. You will know that I knew this was coming before It was coming, and that would actually bolster your faith and your trust. Continuing on, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me where you're going, even though they did, uh, because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. Right? He's saying, he's repeating himself from John chapter 14. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment, concerning sin because they do not believe in me, 
Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. There's so much in this rich, rich passage. And Jesus is repeating some messages he's already told his disciples. It's better that I go. I and the Father are one, and if I don't go, I can't send the Spirit. Like, trust me, guys, you want the Spirit. The Spirit inside of you is better than me beside you. That is what Jesus is communicating. But now, instead of just communicating it sort of in general, he's reminding them that it's better that he goes, that the Spirit comes, because you will face hardship and persecution in this world. And what that tells us is this helper won't decrease the resistance, but it will empower us to stand firm in the midst of it. Right? Even in this, the promise is not that we'll be rescued from the hatred of the world or the persecution that Christians might face or the hardship they might face. The promise is that we will have help, listen, to properly bear witness to Jesus, the person and work of Jesus in the midst of hardship. That's profound. Look at at the end of chapter 15. Jesus says, when the helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, he'll get you out of it. He'll rescue you. No, no, he will be with you and he will bear witness about me and you will bear witness about me. He's like, as you experience resistance in the world, you will have the Holy Spirit to help empower you to share the gospel amidst a hostile culture. But one of the things we also see is not only the helper will come, but Jesus is trying to prepare his disciples for life without him in the flesh right next to them. He knows a few things are going to happen. He knows he's going to leave. And he knows things are going to get even more difficult for his disciples. So he's preparing them for the day, which is coming very, very soon, that he is leaving them when he ascends to heaven and they will be facing the world as disciples of Jesus And they will take the brunt of the assault because Jesus himself will not be there in the flesh. And he tells the disciples straight up, you have to prepare for the hatred of the world to come to bear on you. And he doesn't want us to fall away. He says, I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. Now, I don't know what your theological heritage is, but that may mess with you a little bit. The New Testament mentions people that have fallen away, have shipwrecked their faith, or are in love with this present world, or have even been handed over to the enemy. And it can be hard for some of us who grew up in a theological construct that says, once saved, always saved. Right? It's like a box you check, and then it's like forever cemented in. So to hear Jesus say something like, "All I have said to you all these things to keep you from falling away, our brains start to go, wait a second, Jesus, don't you know that nobody that is saved can ever fall away? And the Bible, unlike us often, does not mind living in the tension here. The tension that says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1. And also, I've said these things to you to keep you from falling away. Whatever our theological system that we bring to the table is, we have to incorporate the tensions that we see in Scripture. And that Scripture doesn't always resolve for us. It doesn't always give us a neat, clean, tidy answer. Sometimes it invites us to live in these paradoxes, these tensions. Jesus knew resistance was about to come and would ramp up in a huge way. And it would test the resolve of the faith of many of his followers. He prepares us for it. And he told us to expect resistance. Expect that the more you look like Jesus, the more the world is going to fight against you. I don't want you to fall away. Peter so often reminds us in his letters to expect hardship, suffering, trials. And not only expect them and not be surprised, but rejoice in them. He calls us to stand firm. There will be a temptation to fall away, but you have the Holy Spirit as a helper 
to help you. Not to zap you and remove you from any hard situation, but to be present with you. Because Jesus has not left us nor forsake us. He is present with you. And not only empowering you to stand firm, but empowering you to be a gospel presence in those moments, both in word and in deed, to bear witness to Jesus. The takeaway from a passage like this is actually really simple. You will face resistance in this abiding life with Jesus, but you have help to withstand that resistance. That's what Jesus says. Following me will be hard. It will not be comfortable. It will not be easy. And if you're doing it right, it especially will not be comfortable. It will not be easy. It will challenge you. It'll put you at odds with certainly the enemy, but also the world and the culture around us. But you have help. You have the Spirit inside you. Because of the work of Christ, He is always, always, always with you. And there are a number of things that at any given moment, are actively working against Jesus' presence, shaping you to look more like him. We talk about this frequently as a church, the world, the flesh, the enemy, all these formation voices trying to get you to become something or someone other than the person Jesus intends you to be. But neither your formation into the likeness of Christ or your formation into the likeness of the world are inevitable. There's definitely ways that are more natural than others, and pending any action on your part, you will probably look more like the world than more like Jesus, but you actually have an opportunity to play a role in your own growth, to play a role in your standing firm, your bearing witness, partnering with the helper that Jesus sent so you could stand firm and bear witness. Will you? I think that's the invitation from this text, is to partner with the helper that Jesus has sent to stand firm, to resist the world around us, to resist the enemy, to resist our own fleshly desires, and to bear witness to Jesus in word and in deed. So how will you set up your life in a way to withstand the inevitable resistance that's coming? One of the ways we've laid out to do this as a church community is through our community rule of life. It's not only to make space for abiding with Jesus, although that's its primary function, but it's also to withstand the onslaught of those voices trying to form you into something or someone else. So regular rhythms of cultivating gratitude and generosity of Sabbath and community, rhythms of parenting your phone and starting your day with scripture and not anything digital. All of those are helping you abide with Jesus, but they're also helping you withstand the attacks of the world around us. You have a choice in your growth. You have a choice to either become more like Jesus or become less like him. Now, thankfully, the Spirit does the heavy lifting, but we are still called to play a part in that. So how will you cultivate and set up your life in a way to withstand the inevitable resistance from the world around us. I would encourage you to maybe camp out on that question in light of this text here, to invite Jesus, invite the Spirit of God in you into a conversation. How will we do this together? And I encourage you to actually do it. Don't let some information come into your head, go, nice talk, Bert, and then move on with your life, but actually pause Sit, consider, what might it look like to set up your life in a way to withstand the inevitable resistance of the world? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you never leave us or forsake us. Thank you that as you're preparing your disciples to leave, you said, I will send the helper and it will be better. And as much as we wish we could walk with you and be next to you, thank you that we live in a time and place in human history where we have access to your spirit. Jesus, we know the world around us runs counter to the ways of your kingdom. Help us be bold. Help us stand firm. Help us to cultivate and set up a life that leans us toward abiding with you, but also helps withstand the hatred and the attacks of the world around us. We know we can only do this in the power of your Holy Spirit, but we also know that you call us to play a part in our own growth and our own sanctification. Help us live in that space of abiding with you, resisting the world. 
We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.